Brilliant. Welcome and thank you for joining us at this panel. My name is Cynthia Bullock and I'm the Deputy Director for the UKRI's Healthy Aging Challenge. Um, this session, I should mention, is uh, sponsored by Novavax and it's all about promoting health through the life course. So um, we'll be emphasizing a focus on health span, not lifespan. We have a really great panel for you, and um, it's quite nice to be chairing a session where I know so many people, so it feels like I'm, I'm working with friends. Uh, so that's good. So each of them will be um, providing an opening statement of five minutes. We will then move to discussions, and I hope at the end of that you will have some questions and comments for the panel. That should hopefully lead us to a really interesting and lively discussion. Um, so just to set the scene, which will be completely familiar <laughs> on the basis of the last session we've just had, and I'm sure most of the work uh, that you all have been doing in your day job. We are living longer, but not necessarily healthier, and definitely not enjoying the full benefits of that longer life. Uh, we know that good health boosts our ability to work, volunteer, care, and spend time doing whatever else we want to do. Uh, and we also know that many health conditions, not all of them, we accept, but many can be avoided uh, and, um, and we're still uh, spending more money, unfortunately, um, on uh, curing rather than preventing ill health. And we also have heard this morning that inequalities still persist in the system, which is um, a bit disheartening, if I must, if I must admit. Additionally, particularly having lived through the COVID pandemic, the prevalence of mental health conditions has increased by 20% between 1993 and 2014, and I suspect has gone even higher since then. Yet only one in three adults with a common mental health problem is receiving any treatment. And poor mental health appears to be growing faster in children and young people people. One in four adults have at least one health condition and on current traje trajectory without further intervention the government's target of five years of extra life expectancy by 2035 looks less and less likely. Really grateful to be part of the ILC's uh, launch today of the white paper on longevity to help tackle some of these issues. And we are and will be inviting a stellar panel uh, to help discuss some of these points. So at this point, I would like to invite to the stage Dr. Hannah Berendt, Dr. Anna Dixon, Arunima Himawan, uh, Professor Dame Louise Robinson and Jennifer Blaney to the panel, please. Thank you. So to start us off, I would uh, like to invite Aaron, uh, who is a senior health research lead at ILC UK, who will be speaking about ILC's Healthy Aging and Prevention Index. Aaron leads the ILC's Global Health Programme of Work and currently manages ILC's Prevention Programme. She has previously led a number of other health projects, ranging from medication adherence to structural heart disease and adult immunisation. She is on the steering group of the EU Structural Heart Disease Coalition and the ILC's Global Alliance Gender and Ageing Committee. Aaron. Some reason I can't see the slides in here. Sorry, one second, please. 
If not, I can just turn my head this turn way. Head. <laughs> Hopefully you can hear me. Okay. Oh, oh, great, perfect. Okay, thank you. Um, so it was so nice to see you all today. Thank you so much for taking the time um, to join us at our Future of Aging conference. Um, I thought I'd kick off the session with talking about our Healthy Aging and Prevention Index, and hopefully this will help to give kind of a sense of what the global trends in population health are and where the UK sits at the global um, level. So our Healthy Aging and Prevention Index ranks 121 countries on six healthy aging metrics. We look at lifespan, health span, work span, uh, income, environmental performance, uh, and happiness. And essentially, this is so that we can um, understand how well governments have adapted uh, to longevity. So these are the top 50 countries that are on our index. Um, countries that perform equally well are also assigned an equal ranking. That's why you see a few countries like Australia, Luxembourg, Netherlands, all ranked at the same uh, position. The UK doesn't do too badly here, actually quite well. Um, and what we know is that actually all EU countries uh, are ranking are ranked in the top 50, except for, however, Bulgaria, which currently ranks uh, 56. Um, we also have 64% of countries in the top 50 come from the uh, WHO Europe region. So at first glance, what we see is that there are huge inequalities across our index. If we assume that the top 10 countries um, are best adapted to longevity, we see that that only accounts for just over 1% of the global population. So we can see that only a very small proportion of people are benefiting from longer and healthier lives. Um, and if we take an even closer look at some of our individual metrics, we see that there are inequalities for lifespan, health span, and work span between the top 10 and bottom 10 countries for each of these uh, specific metrics. Our index also uh, ranks political and economic block rankings. This is another way for us to uh, hold governments to account on healthy aging. And what we see here is that across nine political groups that we've looked at, Scandinavia ranks in first place, African Union ranks last. Those circled in green are where the UK are a member of uh, that political group. Um, they do generally quite well. G7 ranks second. The UK ranks 15th for OECD, so slightly lower, and that's partly due to having uh, a number of European countries, but also countries outside of the region like Canada, Australia, New Zealand that perform particularly well. They also rank quite high uh, uh, in the G20, and that partly accounts for the lower middle income countries that are part of that group. So let's take a closer look at the UK um, and the individual metrics and where the UK ranks. The UK does particularly well on environmental performance and happiness, um, not so well on work span and sort of medium well on the, uh, lifespan and income. Um, one thing I wanted to point out was, and uh, if we just look at the health span metric to get a sense of, and David had mentioned this earlier in his presentation of how long it would take us, almost 200 years for us to actually uh, meet the uh, target of uh, increasing healthy life expectancy for all by five years. If we were to do that on the index, um, the UK would move up to first position for the health span metrics surpassing Japan. So when we talk about policies being bold, we really do mean that. We mean what can make it so that the UK jumps up 28, 29 spots on our index. So I want to just spend a couple minutes just looking at what it is that countries like the UK can do to improve their, rank, uh, improve their ranking. And one of the things that countries can do is invest in preventative health. This is a very clear uh, correlation between countries that spend a greater proportion of their health budgets on prevention do better on the index. And this is something that governments can put money behind. In addition to just spending on prevention, they can also specifically invest in, immu in immunization programs. But one thing I also want to highlight is um, you can probably see quite quickly here that there is quite a significant difference between total preventative health spend and spending that goes towards immunization. Um, this is a clear win for governments. Investing more we know can bring significant economic returns. Just one euro spent on immunization can generate a four euro uh, return on investment for those aged 50 and over. So huge benefits there. And we also know having access to healthcare is really important. Um, countries that perform well have greater access to doctors. Those ranked between 11 and 40, so that includes the UK, have about uh, 35 doctors per 10,000 population. This reduces significantly towards the end of the index, so those ranked 70 over, which only have five doctors per 10,000 um, 10, uh, population. And this includes large countries like India, but the majority of the African continent as well. 
And I want to um, leave with one final point is that this index is relative. Even countries that perform at the top of the index can still do better. And I think this graph just demonstrates um, areas in which um, countries across our index can improve. And that's when it comes to uh, uh, diet and lack of exercise. This is significantly hampering progress for countries across the index. For those ranking at the top, um, it's uh, adult obesity. And those ranking at the bottom is average um, uh, adult undernourishment. Those in the middle, you can see, are experiencing a double burden, and that's likely to spread um, in future years. So thank you so much for um, your time, and I look forward to taking questions um, at the end. Thank you, Aaron. So our second speaker um, and invitee is Jennifer Blaney. Uh, she is the Director of Government Affairs for the UK, Ireland, and the Nordics at Novavax. Jennifer has spent 15 years working in healthcare policy and government affairs across a wide range of policy areas, including public health, life sciences, cancer, and long-term conditions. She has been published in Pharmaceutical Marketing, uh, Health Service Journal, and the British Journal of Healthcare Management. Prior to joining Novavax, she worked for the biopharmaceutical company Celgene and a range of communication agencies, um, advising them on, um, on public health uh, strategies. Uh, Jennifer. Thank you. It's very strange to hear my uh, CV being read out. Um, so uh, <laughs> thank you very much. I just want to say thank you for inviting me to take part in this panel. Um, I'm really pleased to represent Novavax among such uh, incredibly eminent speakers. I just thought I'd start by really just giving you a bit of background as to who Novavax is. Um, we're a global biotechnology company focused exclusively on discovering, developing and delivering vaccines to fight infectious diseases. The company has a very rich heritage in vaccines, and we've refined our recombinant protein technology and adapted it for various emerging diseases. And actually, this work positioned us really well when COVID-19 hit back in 2020. It was Novavax's COVID-19 vaccine uh, that was the first protein-based option to be available in Europe during the pandemic. And we also actually placed our largest, well, one of the largest clinical trials the UK has ever had here in um, the UK in 2020 for our COVID vaccine. And we recruited over 15,000 patients in uh, just about three months, which was really remarkable and a real, real testament to the UK. And actually the very nature of what Novavax is doing is preventive healthcare. Vaccines are are key to helping people stay healthy alongside other things like screenings and checkups and lifestyle advice. And these are you know, very simple offerings which can have huge impacts. But just because something is simple doesn't actually necessarily mean it's simple to implement. <laughs> Vaccines are the cornerstone of public health which is rooted in the concept of prevention. The UK has actually had consistently high levels of vaccination, although sadly it has started to slip down the ranks a little bit in the last few years. The UK Health Security Agency actually said in September that it's seriously concerned about the ongoing downward trend in childhood vaccinations. And the consequences of that can be seen here in London, where I live, particularly in South East London, where we've seen outbreaks of polio, uh, outbreaks of measles, sorry, and a re-emergence of polio. So it's really important to highlight as well that we've moved from a time long ago, really, where vaccination was just about vaccinating children. It is now something... Uh, that adults can be expected to be vaccinated well into old age for things like flu, COVID obviously, RSV, shingles, and there's future things coming down the pipeline. But what we do need to do is guard against vaccine fatigue. For example, again, the UK Health Security Agency just warned last week that less than half of those people who are eligible for a COVID and flu vaccine for this autumn haven't actually taken up their appointments. And it would be great to see the government publish their vaccine strategy to understand their plans to increase vaccination rates and the role that companies like us, Novavax and others, can play in restoring the UK to that global leading position in vaccination rates. But to realise the benefits of vaccination, there must be robust uptake in those target populations. Vaccination rates vary significantly across countries, but also within the same countries, we can find those same differences. So we feel that what you need to concentrate on is investing in tackling the three C's, which is confidence, complacency, and convenience. I think we all recognize that public confidence in the safety and efficacy of vaccines is critical to driving uptake. 
availability and access to differentiated uh, COVID-19 vaccination options may play a role in helping contribute to that uptake. But it's also important to remember here in the UK through MHRA, UK HSA and JCVI, those three bodies are, are the ones who decide what vaccinations you will get here. And it's important to know that those three bodies will always make sure that you are going to be recommended the right vaccine for you. you you know, the public can trust that there is a very robust system in place here. But also not everyone who is unvaccinated is actually vaccine hesitant. For many, it's just a complacency issue. It's a matter of tackling questions like, is COVID actually really important at this stage? Isn't COVID over? Sadly, I wish I could say it is, but sadly it's not. Uh, and if you are eligible in one of the cohorts at the moment, I would recommend please do get vaccinated, particularly if you are at higher risk. Because we've just seen this week that the House of Commons Speaker, Lindsay Hoyle, has sadly had to cancel his attendance at lighting the Christmas tree because he has tested positive for COVID-19. But also for others, it might be a question of, well, I'd love to get vaccinated, but I have a busy schedule. Something I can totally, totally understand being a full-time working mother of two children. So for these people, it's a question of convenience. So it's really important to make sure that vaccination is as convenient as possible and everyone has access to it. So for example, making it more available in pharmacies and also making it available as a drop-in rather than necessarily having to have an appointment. And then we really need to continue to invest in diverse portfolios of vaccinations, particularly for COVID. There are new strains emerging and we're not yet sure which impact those different strains will have. And this means a number of things, including ensuring that vaccines are available for multiple suppliers and a plurality of technology platforms. And as I mentioned, the availability of vaccine options can really help address that confidence issue and it will allow your healthcare professional to make sure that they're choosing exactly the right one for you. The importance of the diversity of portfolio was also noted actually by the UK Public Accounts Committee back last year in July 2022 when they recommended that the UK government really urgently review their future procurement strategy for COVID-19 vaccines to ensure that contracts are not limited to just a narrow set of uh, manufacturers. And finally, the private and public sectors need to continue investing into the development of the next generation of vaccines. Healthcare professionals and consumers have been asking us for vaccines that are more convenient and provide better and longer protection. One can imagine the appeal, for example, for a COVID influenza combination vaccine, which could simplify the vaccination schedule for the target groups. But really what is key is that the UK should strive to be a partner of choice for innovative companies developers and researchers to make sure that the UK is a global leader for vaccine development and uptake. Thank you. Thank you. I feel thoroughly convicted. I'm one of those really busy people who haven't gotten around yet to have my vaccine <laughs> as an asthmatic. So moving on very quickly, uh, our next speaker is Professor Dame Louise Robinson. Uh, she's a professor of primary care. Uh, I've got a lot to read. I think you should sit down. <laughs> Sorry. Just saying. Um, she's, the, she's a professor of primary care and ageing at Newcastle University. Uh, Louise was invited to speak um, about what the next government can learn from key findings from the primary care-led post-diagnostic dementia care project and what must be done by both local and national governments to improve the lives of people living with dementia and their carers. Louise is an academic GP. Uh, she was the first GP to be awarded a prestigious NIHR professorship. She also holds the first UK Regis professorship in ageing. She leads a research programme focused on improving quality of life and quality of care for older people, especially those with dementia. She leads uh, one of the only three Alzheimer's Society National Centres of Excellence on dementia care, and she is the primary care lead for the Prime Minister's Dementia Challenge and is a member of the National Dementia Care Guidelines Development Group. Louise. It's highly unfair when the chair gets longer to speak than your, your talk is going to take. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry for that biography. Um, I've, my five minutes uh, is going to be focused on dementia. Now, you might think, why are we talking about dementia in a session that's looking at healthy lifespan 
and health across the life course. Because I think most of you will probably assume, and you've heard from our first panel, that dementia is an illness that we associate with old age. However, dementia certainly is the commonest cause of death in women over 65, and age is, an increasing age, is the strongest risk factor. The older you are, the more likely you are to developing dementia. But what I hope to do in the next four minutes and 30 seconds is convince you that we should be very much taking a lifespan approach to dementia. Uh, and not just looking at finding a magic drug and looking at the causes, but as well as looking at care, we should be looking at prevention and risk reduction. And I'm going to start a bit like Aaron with a, an index. And this is a, 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 an innovation readiness index that was carried out uh, for Alzheimer's Europe, looking at how European countries, how well prepared they were to cope with the tsunami of dementia that is going to come with our increasingly aging populations. In fact, numbers of people with dementia are going to double in the next 20 years. Now, on the left are the overall scores on the doors. And you will see, pleasingly, that the UK is top of the class. We're top of the Premier League. But when you break that overall score down into the criteria that they looked at um, to get to that overall score, we don't do that well. Where we score highly is in the strategy uh, and commitment uh, level, which is in the middle and we're top of the league there. And that makes sense because we were one of the first European countries to have a national dementia strategy way back in 2009. Then David Cameron, when he was prime minister, took dementia, took the unprecedented step of having dementia as his like, personal challenge, if you like. And we had a, a prime minister's national dementia challenge, which lasted for nine years. So dementia's very much been in the policy, high on the policy landscape. But when you look at our access to care and support, we're in the bottom third. The other area we did well on was also in research funding and commitment to putting money into dementia research. But actually, if we look very closely at where that money's going on dementia research, I would argue that it's not being given out equitably or fairly. So, following on from David Cameron's strategy, 250 million was allocated to the, the, UK, the first UK Dementia Research Institute, which is held at UCL with hubs around the country. And that's doing great work, but it's largely focused on cure and finding magic therapies and tablets. A smaller and much smaller amount of money went into looking at care and improving care and prevention. Last year, some of you may have heard about the Dame Barbara Windsor mission that's another 95 million. And that money is largely going to looking at how we can roll out new drugs, which are not yet here and are not yet available within our country and a trials network. Again, admirable, but is it appropriate in view of what I'm now going to tell you? The, the figure on the right is taken from a report by the Alzheimer's Society eight years ago, which showed that in 2016, 40% of people diagnosed with dementia felt they didn't have access to necessary support following a diagnosis. And it was that report and the announcement of the 250 million into the uh, Dementia Research Institute that led the Alzheimer's Society to put 6 million into funding three centres of research looking at dementia care. And myself at Newcastle and my team were very lucky to get one of those. And ILC has been very much part of that working with us. And what we've been looking at is this post-diagnostic care. And we looked at what was currently happening, and sure enough, we found that people largely were not getting access to the care and support we needed. That there was a much wider and bigger uh, postcode lottery in service provision than even we thought as the researchers on the team. And much of those services and support were focused in the first year or two after diagnosis. And you've already heard one of our speakers had her father living 20 years with dementia. And the funding for them was often just was very short term, often only two years and then not being replaced. But what we also did in that with that uh, 1.6 million of money was look at what was the best model of providing dementia care. 
And that actually was not so much a mental health model, but looking at dementia more as a long-term illness and actually adopting a model where the bulk of people are cared for in the community with a model akin to that we provide for cancer, where you have specialist nurses as well as information support actually being put in at an early stage to try and improve the quality of life and quality of care. And that model was one of the few selected to be in the World Alzheimer's Report in 2022, looking at how we can best give post-diagnostic care. But I think, for someone who's been doing this for a long time, the most groundbreaking research that's happened in, in dementia field in the last 10 years has been this on the left. And this is a diagram taken from uh, the Lancet Commission on Dementia, which was led by Jill Livingston from UCL, which actually summarised all of the evidence to date and found that actually not only was age a risk factor for dementia, but there are 11 modifiable risk factors, just like heart disease and stroke disease, that we could be addressing, that if we addressed them from an early stage, could actually reduce future numbers of depression, people living with dementia by 40%. And this work, which includes factors such as um, hearing loss, uh, high blood pressure, obviously exercise, Mediterranean diet, but also keeping your brain active, keeping social networks up, could actually re reduce your personal risk of getting dementia. And that's starting at a very early age, including ensuring you have ongoing education. And it's this work on dementia risk factors and prevention that led to the WHO in 2017 declaring dementia a global public health issue. And this diagram on the right is taken from their document looking at what uh, governments, the approach they should be taking to address dementia. And as you see, there's a seven-pronged approach, including risk reduction, raising awareness, diagnosis and care, and supporting families. There's no mention, or there's very little mention, of magic drugs in that global health response. However, there is hope. The latest, NHS, uh, the latest NHS health strategy is actually called the Major Condition Strategy, and I've put a summary of, summary of it on the right here. And what it does is it looks at um, focusing the spending of the NHS on the six most burdensome conditions, what they've called the major conditions. And dementia is now up with that top six, which also includes cancer and heart disease uh, uh, and mental health issues. And as you will see, that strategic framework very much focuses not just on diagnosis and, and care, but also on primary and secondary prevention. So it's much more in line which, with the WHO framework for how we should be responding to dementia as an illness. So in conclusion, I think it's really good that our national policy is mirroring the global policy and including a, a risk prevention approach to dementia. But I also say that I really think we should be taking a fresh look at how we allocate funding for not just providing care, but certainly for research. And I also argue, and this is my personal view, that we should be redressing the balance of what we should be researching and not just looking at finding a magic drug, because there may not be a magic drug for an illness that has multiple factors and a life course approach to its onset. Thank you. the risk of showing where my um, sympathies lie. Can I just say, here, here? <laughs> right. Our, uh, our fourth speaker is Dr. Anna Dixon, Chair of the Reimagining Care Commission. Uh, Anna will draw on her extensive knowledge and expertise in health and care and her capacity as the former Chair of the Reimagining Care Commission. Anna is a strategy, governance, and policy consultant uh, working with national charities and organizations in health and social care sectors. She brings over 20 years of experience in health and social care with expertise in aging and public health. She's an effective influencer and leader, having held a number of senior positions, including Director of Strategy and Chief Analyst at the Department of Health and Social Care and Director of Policy at the King's Fund. 
She brings insight from her work internationally for the World Health Organization and European Observatory on Health Systems and Policy. And I know Anna personally because we also co-opted her onto the UKRI's Healthy Aging Challenge Advisory Group. Obviously the best thing you've ever or good. <laughs> Thank, thank you very much, uh, Cynthia. I'm just going to sit and uh, make a few uh, remarks, uh, particularly in response to the excellent uh, white paper that ILC have uh, published today, for which I commend the team uh, on an excellent uh, job. So the theme of this session is health span, not lifespan, and I couldn't agree more that it's really important that we are focusing not on just extending life, but on making sure uh, those years of life are lived uh, in, in good health. We've heard that this was the ambition um, of the last government, the Healthy Ageing Challenge, or was it the government before last, but anyway, um, uh, to uh, close the gap uh, and to add five years of um, healthy life expectancy. We've also, and the report sets out the evidence for this, seen the reality that those gains in life expectancy that we've come to sort of enjoy over many decades have slowed. Um, and I think analysis is suggesting that's a combination of austerity and then the impact of COVID. But we have also seen for the poorest women that life expectancy has gone into reverse. We've also seen the gap, whether it's in healthy life expectancy or my preferred measure, which is disability-free life expectancy expectancy between the richest and poorest areas is widening. I think the number that um, David and the team uh, put out with there was 19 years. That's 19 years longer living with disability and poor health if you live in a poor area of this country compared to the richest area. That's pretty shocking. So I want to highlight just three of the areas of recommendation that the report makes uh, in how we should be addressing this. Uh, the first, prevention. The second is joining up work and health. And the third is care and support, drawing on some of the work I did with the archbishops. So the first, in terms of investment and prevention, I think we can all say aye. And we've been hearing lots of commitment to shifting uh, resources to prevention for many years, but it's easier said than done. Uh, I think that some of the historic moves, for example, putting the public health budgets into local government have weakened some of the uh, investment in prevention. We've got to hope that the integrated care systems have new incentives for population health, but I think the early signs are that uh, they continue to prioritise acute care. So I think we have to go for the so-called bold recommendations. We heard about that in the first panel. The evidence is there that structural measures work, whether it's all of the smoking bans, the things that we've done over many years to reduce smoking, the sugar tax, minimum alcohol pricing. I think the harder area where we're not really sure what the structural measures are is around physical activity. But there, it has to be things like investment in public transport, planning, active travel, some of those structural things in our environment. So that's the first area. Yes to prevention, but let's actually do some of that bold stuff. Second is around work and health. The economic costs of ill health have really shot up the agenda. This is something that colleagues um, have done a huge amount at, at Aging Better, um, where, where I used to work, to really show the economic cost of the early onset of disability that leads people to drop out of work, this 50-plus economic inactivity rate that has now got on the politicians' ad agenda, uh, finally. But what to do about it? Uh, many of these people, primary prevention is great, but these are people who have already in their early 50s got the onset. So we need proactive rehab, things like physio, occupational therapy. We need better chronic disease management. Access, particularly for low income. Remember, these people are low income. It means um, access to leisure services. We've seen some great work with UK Active uh, linking up with the NHS. So that's part of it. It needs employment support. Again, a shout out to colleagues in Greater Manchester, done an amazing trial of working well, proper employment support linked up with health support. That's got to be right. We've got to put a health element into employment support, not more sanctions in my view. But there is a missing element I think about that we need to talk more about, which is on the employer side. We need good work. The reason that many people who are in insecure, low-pay work, in jobs that are physically demanding, like care work, like manual work, 
these are leading to those high rates of MSK and depression. Um, whether that's younger people we heard about earlier in, the, in their 30s in poor areas out of work because of, of, of ill health. So we've got to think about how we make good work uh, which promotes people's health and it doesn't create negative ill health. So that's the second area. And the third, just very brief, briefly, um, as was mentioned, um, I was privileged enough to chair the Reimagining Care Commission. And if you don't know the report, please have a look at it. We set out a long-term vision and uh, we got it out before the Fabians. And I think, Andrew, uh, there are echoes, I think, of some of what we put in there in uh, the work that he and the Fabians have done around um, the National Care Service. But at its heart, we're saying... Care and support is a means to help people to live a full life, to contribute throughout their life, regardless of disability, mental health, dementia, whatever issues. And I guess this is where we're arguing for a shift in attitudes, again, from a sort of longevity as a burden to something that we recognise as an opportunity, but actually affects us all. Um, and we want universal access to a much wider range <clears throat> of care and support, not just the personal care, and the statutory services, but something much broader than that that recognises our social, emotional and spiritual uh, dimensions. And in it, we call for a national care covenant, and we can come to this in the discussion, but really saying the bold idea is this rebalancing of the state, family, communities and citizens. And we think that, yes, bigger role for the state, but part of that needs to be in supporting family carers, as we heard in the first session, to do what they need to do. So I'm really pleased with this report, uh, the emphasis on health span, not lifespan, but I would say let's continue to maintain a bold ambition. Let's make sure it doesn't take another 100 years to, to get those five more years of healthy life expectancy, um, but it will need a concerted effort across some of those areas. So thanks, Cynthia. Fantastic. Thank you. And our last speaker, but certainly not the least, uh, is Dr. Hannah Berendt, uh, Director of Health and Wellbeing at the Behavioural um, Insights Team. Um, Hannah has been with the Behavioural Insights Team for the last nine years, working with a wide range of partners in the UK and across the world to deliver projects um, applying behavioural insights to improve health and wellbeing. Hannah combines in-depth experience of policy development and evaluation with deep expertise in behavioral science. Before joining Behavioral Insights team, Hannah spent several years at the World Bank working on environmental economics and the World uh, Development Report on Mind and Society. Welcome, Hannah. Good morning, um, and I'm really delighted to be part of this fantastic panel representing the Behavioural Insights team with perhaps the unenviable task of going last, which I foolishly accepted following so many fantastic speakers. So what I'm going to do is to try and bring a behavioural perspective, but also perhaps summarise a little bit, I think, um, what we've heard. Um, in case you don't know about us, the Behavioural Insights team, we're a social purpose company, and at the core we're about bringing a better understanding of how real humans actually behave in practice to policy making. And that's to help really our partners to develop more effective systems, policies, products and services. Now, when it comes to increasing our health span, from a behavioural perspective, I think there's good news and there's bad news. I think, let's start with the positive. We know what needs to be done. And building on what Louise said, it's not a magic cure that we're looking for. It's really the modifiable risk factors, many of which are behavioural. The CMO's report um, out a couple of weeks ago noted that, you know, while some healthy ageing is due to good luck, the chances of delaying disease and disability are substantially increased by straightforward measures individuals can take to prevent or significantly delay disease. Now, the bad news is that those straightforward measures individuals can take are actually really quite hard. Um, if you ask anyone that's tried to quit smoking or lose some weight. However, fortunately, not wanting to end on a downer, I think there is further good news, and that is that it doesn't always have to be hard. Policy is informed by really having a nuanced understanding of human behaviour can help people lead healthier, happier lives for longer. And I'd like to distill three key messages that summarise how we can achieve this. 
The first one is one that I think many of us might have seen this morning while traveling here, if we weren't stuck on a canceled train like me. Um, the first one is Mind the Gap. So, and this is building a bit on Jennifer's remarks. Um, I wonder if I could do a quick poll. So, could I have a quick show of hands in the room? Who's had their flu shot this season? Yeah, wow, okay. <laughs> this is, I mean, I should have probably expected it given sort of this, um, you know, the, the topic of this talk, but, but that's really positive. Um, now, who's planning to get it but hasn't quite got around to it? I think we've got, we've got, yeah. Um, I knew there was two of us. <laughs> um, and the thing is, right, life has a knack of getting in the way, and it always will. And there's a really well-established gap between intention and action, especially in healthy behaviors. Sometimes we just forget, or traveling to the pharmacy is too great a barrier, and that's why simple things like a well-designed text message reminder, for example, or making vaccines just really easily accessible is so powerful. And bridging this gap, I think, is really key for genuine and lasting change. The second message, beyond Mind the Gap, is um, paraphrasing a fairly well-known line. It's the environment, stupid. I'm not going to do the accent. Um, so behavioral sciences tell us that much of our behavior is automatic or habitual. Our choices are heavily influenced by environmental cues, or the choice architecture, as we call it, and our use of mental shortcuts. So consider the impact of you know, where food options are positioned in a canteen versus the deliberative decisions based on nutritional information. If I think to the break just now, you know, did I eat two quite chunky bits of shortbread, yes I did. Do I know that that's a bad idea? Given my job, you'd hope that I do. So while information and education can be helpful, altering people's environments directly can be a much more effective way to change health-related behaviors. And now take the sugar levy as an example. On the surface, this looks like a typical tax on an unhealthy ingredient. However, the sugar levy actually had a very behavioral design um, with carefully selected levels to target the producers to incentivize reformulation and hence change the environment. Um, we think about this as a sort of a double nudge in a way. And that means that people can actually continue doing the behavior that they were doing, buying sugar drinks, but they automatically get a lower sugar content. So finally then, um, when designing policies and programs, I have a final um, simple message, which is go east. So at the Behavioral Insights team, we developed a simple framework um, a couple of years ago, which summarizes lots of insights from behavioral science. And simply put, it says, if you want to change a behavior, make it easy, attractive, social, and timely. And that spells out East. Now, I'm delighted to see that the CMO report actually noted that one of the most effective ways to maintain independence into older age is to make exercise easy and attractive throughout life. And I'd love to discuss more about what that could look like in practice. So, in closing, I think our collective commitment to enhancing health span really requires a nuanced and better understanding of human behavior. We need policies, we need interventions that acknowledge the challenges that individuals face and that create environments that really help to support healthier and happier lives for all of us. So, thank you very much, and I look forward to the discussion. So interestingly, at the end of the last session, I wrote down how do we apply behavioral change to the political classes. It would be nice to see how we can apply the East principle to the, yeah, the politicians. No comments. Right, so this concludes our presentations, and uh, this is now time for questions. So if you, I'm going to do what Kate did, because I thought that worked really well. If you have a question, if you put your hands up, I'll sweep up a couple of them and then present them to the panel. Uh, I think we have time for a couple. Uh, so who has a question? Great. So um, should we start from the top and walk our way down? The lady in black, the guy in black, and Yvonne, and uh, the guy over there as well. Great. Start. Thanks. Um, I'm Nicola Upton. I'm a independent consultant, but was recently the CEO of the Cares family, which some of you will know, sadly closed um, due to financial insolvency about a month ago. And, and that's the root of my question. So it's been interesting hearing what you're saying. In a world where there is an increasing over-reliance on community organisations to provide the prevention, the fun, the connection, 
the loneliness prevention and actually a lot of the broader preventative work at the same time as a huge cost of giving crisis, as our colleagues at NCBO call it. How do we address that fundamental challenge to implementing some of the things that you're talking about? Who's next? Oh, there was the guy over there, I think. Yeah, you were, you were next, and then I'll come down to you, and then Yvonne. Thank you. Hi. Um, one of the questions I'd ask is, what behavioural um, policies would you uh, encourage, for example, wi within the workplace, uh, which is an imp most of us here earn money uh, throughout our lives. Um, so, um, which would, it, for example, in the workplace, auto enrolment has been very, very successful in pr in, in helping um, people in the long term. Uh, uh, possibly have a, a better retirement income. So what three policies would you encourage in the workplace to, behaviourally, for example, to uh, improve people's outcomes? Thank you. Um, thanks. Um, with the NHS, which is um, struggling, visibly struggling, and we have a looming winter crisis coming, and we'll we see pictures of ambulances queuing outside A&E, um, and now that, as you say, ICBs are commonly led by acute hospitals where they're very focused on high-volume treatment, um, community and preventive care has been part of the rhetoric for a long time, but we seem to be further away from it than we've ever been before. Um, in a system where there's always another crisis, how do you think it's practically possible to start diverting large resources to, like, in real, in real life to prevention and community care? Thank you. Yvonne. Yvonne Sonsino, representing Mercer Consulting. Hello, and thank you, everyone. Excellent panel and discussion. I'd be really interested to understand your experts, um, your in input as experts on health, on ultra-processed foods and their role in the future, particularly around prevention. Brilliant. Uh, um, if we have time, I'll come back for more. So for those four questions, shall I come round from Aaron and then sweep up that way? Um, so, yeah, I think, um, so there's a few different questions here, and I think some of them uh, will be better place answered by some of the other speakers, um, but I just thought I'd have a few reflections on the work that we've been doing globally, um, uh, and, and how we can translate that to the UK uh, context. So I think one of the, one of the points around um, really looking towards the wider healthcare ecosystem and all the different uh, actors that make that up, not just within the NHS, but looking more broadly, of course, is something that is really, really important to do. Um, the role of, you know, um, charities, third sector organizations in delivering preventative health has, you know, often been really key, is particularly to get, um, particularly to reach marginalized groups. And I think maybe part of the argument should be around, look, at the UK context, looking at who are those groups that are most likely to benefit from health um, improvements in health, and those are going to be the ones where a lot of charities are there to pick up that you know that um, sort of gap in provision for those groups. So I think part of it is to really you know kind of. Uh, demonstrate to policymakers that you know there is a huge gap that these organizations are filling it's really important and this is how we can improve health outcomes across the population um, and so I definitely think you know in terms of getting government involved in that in terms of funding uh, these organizations and picking up that um, sort of financial uh, uh, supporting them financially I think that would that that's really important to make that case um, Generally agree with sort of and what this what David had said previously is um, the you know the, the government role in sort of being a little bit more bit more active and intervening in terms of people's uh, individual behaviors and you know we we do see this working in a lot of other countries um, but I do think we also have to look inwards as well in the UK to understand what sorts of interventions could work um, sugar taxes have worked in a lot of countries in some countries that hasn't worked as well um, so it is important to understand the sort of population uh, makeup 
Um, and finally, I wanted to just raise the point around uh, improving, I improving health outcomes and looking at the wider, wider sort of social determinants of health. I think this is something that we've tried to identify through our index by bringing in together lots of um, bringing together different societal factors that can impact on health and can drive health outcomes, but also can cause, uh, be a causal factor in terms of how well uh, countries can perform. And I think it is really important that we have to recognize that a lot of the decisions that we make are influenced by these wider policy uh, interventions. So in order to sort of uh, change people's behaviors, you also have to look more broadly outside of the healthcare and look at the wider policies um, and, and consider having um, uh, developing policies that actually help people make the, the right decision, I guess. Thank you. So I'll just, I'll just make a couple of comments because I think you're probably more interested on, on, on hearing some of the others in the panel. But I think as somebody who's, who's just worked in private organisations for the last 15 years, a couple of comments I'd make on workplace behaviours. I think there's three really simple things that could be done, which is continue to allow work from home, particularly for parents. It's incredibly important to try and maintain that uh, to make it realistic for parents to continue to work. Uh, free breakfast, when I've worked in companies that provide a free healthy breakfast, particularly when you're young and in your 20s, that can make a huge difference in the food choices that you make. Uh, and then finally, I would say this, wouldn't I, but vaccinations. Anything that companies can do to encourage their staff to get vaccinated is a great thing. Uh, and then on diverting uh, funding towards care, my, as somebody who's worked in government affairs for 15 years, my advice on this is always going to be, and it was a recommendation in the report, is to do more uh, cross-departmental working. And the report, ILC's report recommendation of having a minister that is actually properly responsible for longevity is a great idea. It's a hard one to ask for, but it's a really good idea. But also just to, to come forward with a sort of coalition of people of organizations from all across private public everything all singing from the same hymn sheet makes a huge difference when you're actually trying to get change which is incredibly hard in government basically is it would be it would be my reflection on that thank you louise so working backwards um i'm not going to talk about ultra processed foods but what i am going to talk about is what the research has shown about a healthy mediterranean diet so um I think it's, you know, there's, incre there's increasing evidence building, not just in dementia, but the importance of that, that of a healthy diet. And you look at where the long living people are, such as Japan, Sardinia, and we know certain factors around a healthy diet, such as a Mediterranean diet, are really important, not just in preventing dementia, but in obesity control, in diabetes. Um, in terms of, and cancer probably, uh, and in terms of behavioural policies, uh, 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 and this extends to the workplace, but in, ter in terms of behavioural policies, if I'd had one more slide, the one slide I would have put up was to um, summarise the work uh, that's been led by a Finnish geriatrician called Mia Kivipelto, who uh, 10, 12 years ago really, really... Um, Took, up, took upon herself this fact about looking at the risk factors and, and starting an alternative narrative to helping dementia. So instead of trying to fund and find the magic tablet, she set up a trial called the FINGERS trial, where, and it's called FINGERS because there were five elements of behaviour change. One was diet, one was exercise, one was brain stimulation and cognitive training. The fourth was social interaction, increasing social networks and social interaction. And the fifth was sort of general vascular health, such as making sure diabetes and high blood pressure were well controlled. And in this trial, half of the participants got the fingers intervention and half got usual care. And at the end of the first follow-up, after two years, the intervention group had a third less cognitive impairment than the non-intervention group. And very shortly, because that study has continued to be funded by the Finnish government, uh, the 10-year results will be published. And not only has it, uh, was, was her work, her work was then taken up internationally, and you can Google this, but there's a worldwide fingers network with lots of other countries have actually got research money to roll out and do the fingers trial in their country. So we'll have data from all of these international trials, which will give an alternative narrative 
I think, to the approach to treating dementia rather than just finding a magic tablet. And I think those five things around exercise, diet, um, keeping your brain active, but keeping your social networks to prevent depression and loneliness, and also keeping your physical brain, your, your heart, heart health and body health well, are the five things I would go for. And I think we could um, actually extend that to the workplace, because I work at a university, I also work in a general practice. There's a lot of emphasis on my general mental health, especially since COVID. I'm always being offered support in terms of how I'm coping and work-life balance. Well, that could be extended to look at how we, how we ensure healthy brain aging as well as healthy <laughs> mental health and healthy body aging. And it's not, you know, all of these factors are very much related. And I think the other thing to say in terms of carers, I think one of the things we do need to do is we know a lot about what works well in terms of making life better for people with dementia and hence their family carers. There's been a lot of research on what interventions work. What we haven't done is make sure that it's implemented and make sure that is available and in practice for, for people, for families who are living with this illness. So it's about implementation, not just funding more of what we know works. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was very sorry to hear about um, uh, the care family having been a volunteer um, and got to know some of my neighbours. It was a fantastic intergenerational project that tackled uh, loneliness and, and social isolation. In our report, um, you know, we really emphasise the value of that sort of community um, support for keeping people healthy and well for longer um, and to be able to contribute to their community. And we obviously, because it was a church-sponsored report, we also looked at the role that faith communities played alongside the voluntary and community sector. But one of the things that was very clear and you've experienced, is that that network is very fragile, it's very grant dependent, uh, local authority funding has all but disappeared. We've got investment going into social prescribers, the people, but not into the things that those social prescribers can refer people to. And the disappearance of that infrastructure is felt by family carers, adults with disability, so many people who rely on that for having something to do, the fun bit of life. Um, and so um, we did make proposals of, in that rebalancing that there does need to be investment, particularly some areas where community assets are weaker or poorer. And we suggested about philanthropic sources and statutory sources coming together to have a place-based approach to that, which would be more sustainable and prevent the sort of uh, short-term uh, grant funding. And Leeds Neighbourhood Network, I'll give a shout out, Joe Volpe is up there, has been a really interesting example where a local authority has invested over the long term in ensuring that that social network is there. And, and the only other point that I would pick up was the one about how do we reallocate resources, whether it's within the NHS budget from acute to community um, or across that uh, from NHS to public health and social care. I remember when I was chief analyst at the Department of Health, um, we commissioned work which looked in very economic terms, you know, the cost per quality. People will know perhaps from nice assessments of drugs and treatments. And we looked and tried to look at the relative... Um, effectively cost per quality of public health, NHS and social care. And what was really clear was that, you know, if you have an extra pound to invest, you'll get much more return in terms of that sort of cost benefit analysis if you put it into social care or if you put it into public health. And that is an analysis probably now 10 years ago. And we're still not making that choice. And we're wasting a lot of money, evidently, in the NHS by people who are medically fit for discharge, taking up many, many bed days. And so we've just got to get back to recognising that the problem at the front door is the problem at the back door. And the problem at the back door is there isn't the community support to enable people to go home, be rehabilitated, get back to life um, and, and have that support. 
Um, and so solving the problems, I don't, I mean, I think we should be investing in care and community services for lots of other reasons, but in the short term, if we need to focus minds, the idea that we are buying extra elective capacity in the private sector to sort out waiting times rather than investing in care and support and community services to help free up the capacity that we've already got in our uh, hospitals. But it's a very long-standing um, problem and uh, you know we, we definitely need to crack it because we're currently wasting uh, precious pounds which could be better invested if they were invested differently. Thank you. Final word. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think I'll reflect on three of the questions that were asked. Um, so briefly, um, the question about behavioural policies in the workplace. Um, I'll acknowledge I focus more on health and wellbeing. I have colleagues who have a lot more expertise in kind of workplace and economy. But um, I think I'd pick up on what you mentioned, which was the enormous success of the auto enrolment and having you know the default as sort of being saving for your pension. So I think for three policies, I would say defaults, 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 but in three different ways. So one could be thinking more about, you know, what does the future of auto enrollment look like? Do you have escalation within that? You know, how do you sort of support people to easily save more? Um, I think the other one would be actually thinking about flexibility, as Jennifer said, and how do you actually then make that the default? Um, we've done some work in the past, which was actually looking at job ads and how you know, actually by simply shifting to the default of having flexible working as part of an offer um, can significantly actually also increase the number of applicants that people get for jobs um, and hopefully also increase then, you know, flexibility that people are able to take up because it can be a difficult thing to ask for if it's not something that's kind of just offered as a default. Um, the second point, um, I think, is about, you know, basically that, that big exam question, right? How do we get more investment into prevention? We know that we need it, but at the same time, and this is, I think, where you, if you take this behavioral perspective, not just of the general public, but also of policymakers, it's, it's really obvious, right? Our attention is a limited resource, um, and, you know, the headlines drive where, where attention goes. Um, and actually, um, Cynthia, on your question of, you know, can we, um, can we apply East to, you know, politicians or policymakers? Yes, um, <laughs> we do that. We actually do a whole kind of um, training session about behavioral government and how can you, you know, sort of use some of these things about, you know, thinking more about organizations. Um, I think what Jennifer mentioned in terms of clear responsibility, I think is exactly right. Um, and also thinking about what metrics are you monitoring, right? So having someone that's responsible for it and actually measuring and looking at the things um, that are important. Um, and then finally, just briefly say something about um, ultra-processed foods. So clearly addressing the obesity epidemic is absolutely critical. And when it comes to obesity, we sort of have, I think, a rule of thumb that you know, about 80% of it is down to diet um, and 20% down to physical activity. And addressing physical activity for the wider health benefits is really important. But if you want to shift obesity, you need to look at food. Now, I think ultra-processed foods and the sort of narrative that that's shifting I think can be quite helpful to the extent that it's kind of getting new momentum into the debate and is sort of sparking engagement with it. Um, I think the tricky thing is that not all ultra-processed foods are bad. Many of them are. And I think to the extent that those that are bad, they are also high in saturated fats, sugar, salt, etc. So I think it's, I'd probably say, you know, to the extent that we sort of, you know, that it can drive, you know, the, the sort of the debate forwards, um, it's helpful, but otherwise also let's just keep focusing on the sort of high salt um, fat sugar um, and trying to you know, think of ways that we can design policies that make it easier to avoid those. So I think that's, that's what I'd say. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, so that's it. What's left is for me to thank our panel. <coughs> Uh, thank you, the audience, and thank Novavax for sponsoring this session. And then invite Sue Lewis, who is a trustee of ILC, who will be leading the next um, panel discussion titled Delivering a Decent Income. Thank you, everyone.